Four miles east of Abergavenny, the road turns sharply left and leads you into a deep, quiet valley. The hills are broad-shouldered and wooded. As one goes forward, one slips down a funnel of silent green. An occasional farmhouse, perched high on the hill, seems voluntarily to have withdrawn as far as possible from the racket and hurly-burly of the main road a few miles away. Men have always come here seeking peace, drawn by the beauty and stillness of the hills, the fields and streams of this place. This is the first abbey of Flintoni, surely one of the loveliest and most ill-fated of places, designed in surroundings that hinted of paradise by men dedicated to the holy monastic life. It was a knight named William who began the foundation. He was hunting along the banks of the river Hotheni and came across an ancient chapel of St. David. He was overcome by the loneliness and loveliness of the deep valley. A sense of guilt about his past life shook him as violently as one of those whipping winds that make their winter home among these black mountains of Monmouthshire. He began to build his abbey under the rules of St. Augustine. Sometime between the year 1180 and the year 1210, the first abbey of Flintoni was completed. And even on the basis of these scant ruins, we can say that it must have been one of the gems of religious building in this land. The abbey had little luck. Indeed, monasteries in this valley have had a way of being ill-fated, as we shall see. Plantoni lay on the border between the English and the Welsh, and they, in the days before television and pools, hit a frequent point of raiding and killing each other. One uproarious Welsh chief drove out the monks and held ungodly revels in the church and cloisters. Monks need quiet for their work. They admitted defeat, left the valley and sought sanctuary with the Bishop of Hereford. It was already a ruin, a place for nesting birds and creeping weeds, centuries before the dissolution of the monasteries by that other uproarious Welsh chief, Henry VIII. Now what remains is the prior's lodging kept alive now as a hotel with one of the most fascinating interiors you will ever see, and the ruined nave Lovely enough yet to strike in the remembering mind a few fragmentary notes of what must have been in its day a superlative song. An abbey in its years of high noon, the monks ploughing the fields of prayer and rich earth, designing fresh beauties for their temple, new wisdom for their studies, must have seemed a place of magnificence destined never to depart this earth. But even in a lifetime, as we shall see, the singing can cease. The prayers mutter away in the silence. The books can moulder and the dream turn ashen and cold. men with scythes and dogs and trees with leaves, hilltops with winds and views that renew the will to hope and live, provide the true hints of immortality, the abiding impulses of work, humility and patience, and the desire not to be disturbed. Many men have come to this valley with many different things in mind. To the first abbey of Flintoni came men seeking a kind of peace after lives of dissolute disorder, seeking a renewal of faith after the intrigue and deception of cities and courts. Men of wealth, quite often, seeking something more nourishing than food in the hunger and austerity of the monastic life. Other men came only to seek freedom of worship, the right to be devout in new and simple ways, in smaller and less pretentious temples. Within sight and sound of clean and running water, hills poised forever between indifference and pity, skies looking compassionately down on the strange pattern of love and destruction that makes action the
This is one of the first Baptist chapels in Wales. And those early pioneers of nonconformity could have found no place more securely remote from the busybodies who desired one creed for all men. The abbey has gone. This modest four-square conventicle remains. To its graveyard from every corner of the kingdom return people who sang their first hymns within its walls. Each year, members of the denomination make an anniversary pilgrimage here, standing outside the chapel among the graves, singing praises and remembrance of the dead who once walked this valley, loved its beauty, and left this token of their humble goodness. The urge that some men feel to isolate themselves in monasteries is a powerful and strange one. Some of us can find a monastery a full serenity in any field of brook, a perfection of peace in any acre of woodland. They are the lucky ones of this earth. The ones whose spirits do not quest hungrily for satisfactions, for ecstasies over and beyond the routine experience of everyday life. They are the lucky ones who are content with the natural beauty of this valley, who are grateful each evening for the sight of a setting sun over a familiar hill. The lucky ones who feel complete fulfillment in the spectacle of a rising crop, a hedge, a tree in full flower and fruit. The lucky ones who hear all the anthems of the world in their ears as they pony trek across the moorlands. Men who work among animals, who get to know the needs of animals and give them names, are more serene than men who work among men. Far better to love a lamb and then brood upon its strange progression to being a waistcoat or a dinner than to meditate the latest trick of malice that might lead us into war or promotion at the office. To live near to sheep must be a great help against neurosis. They live so harmlessly. They live with so little guile and brain power they should be an inspiration to us who so often use cunning and cleverness as guides to madness. If they ate more fish, and had more intelligence, they'd have figured out a way long since to outwit that strange alliance of man and dog. Two creatures bent on their branding and dying, one looking rather like themselves, the other looking like a rate pair. But not all men are at peace upon this earth. There are those for whom the sight of a family united in work on the harvest is not the ultimate in happiness. Men for whom there is no peace in the world of men, who find no assuagement in the comforts of a home, in the love of a woman, no glory in the normal worldly ambitions that drive the rest of us on towards the house of lords or jail or gout or bankruptcy. Such a man was Father Ignatius of Jesus, born Joseph Lester Lyon, the man who was driven by his love of the monastic ideal to build the second abbey of Flintoni and came to one of the loneliest parts of Britain here at the very bottom of the Uyas Valley at Capella Fien, at the foot of that incredible road which takes you over the mountain to Herefordshire, and that is getting to Herefordshire the hard way. Ignatius wanted a place from which there was no easy way out, and he very nearly got it. In November 1869, Ignatius, with one helper, retired here to serve, as he said, to serve the Lord God apart from this most wicked world in solitude, self-denial, labor, and prayer. The two men lived in a tiny hut and nearly died in the course of their first winter. The gales of the Monmouthshire Hills do not cater for hermits. On St. Patrick's Day, 1870, the foundation stone was laid and on the 22nd of August, 1872, Father Ignatius laid the foundation stone of this great church. Ten years later, the choir was completed, but the nave was never started. Practically all the money was raised by Father Ignatius in preaching tools, he was a magnetic orator and loved rousing his audiences to a heat of ardent piety. But his monks on their hillside went cold and hungry. The discipline and austerity forced on them by Ignatius were savage. Long fasts were encouraged to camouflage a basic and chronic lack of groceries and income. Ignatius said, monkery has a tendency to drive people mad. And he did quite a few things to prove his point. Study was discouraged. We never allow ourselves to think, said Ignatius. It's all decided for us. He remained at Flantoni for 38 years. The turnover in monks was brisk, for few could stand the self-sacrifice and loneliness. 
He was initiated into the Gorsa the Welsh Bards with the title Dewey Hon Thee in 1899. He became a fervent Welsh nationalist, and during his mission to America, he advertised himself as the Druid of the Welsh Church. He gave strong support to the 1904 mission of Evan Roberts, the great evangelist, and he also believed in Zionism and the theory that the earth is flat. On this spot, on a dark night, standing with a shepherd boy at his side, he saw the same sort of apocalyptic vision of a burning bush as appeared to Moses. He dreamed, he saw visions, he built, and he wrote several sweet songs. Now he is dead and the ruins of the church he meant to be so beautiful lie around his head.